Did I read yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> you don't know what to read. Thank you all for coming exactly. uh, to this wonderful uh, opportunity to see Bob Garden. simple sorting using partial information. This is new work. This is a new presentation. So um, forgive any small errors there might be. Uh, this is joint work with Bernard Feuchler, who was a visiting master student at Princeton and is now at Ha. Um, 
Richard, uh, Bashek, and Jocko are all, not at least they are, but Jocko is moving from Copenhagen. And John Iacono is at the University of, the University of Brussels. How did this come about? I think this is the paper that, this, this is six co-authors, right? This is, uh, I think this is the most co-authors I ever had. So, um, before I get started on this topic, let me just see how this works here. Why is this not working? No, no. Which algorithm does it? Yes, we use you. Yes. 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 Well, we do it this way. Okay, let me make some observations. I've been in this field since 1970, but it's been going since before that. Computer scientists, theoreticians have developed lots of beautiful, theoretically efficient algorithms and data structures. But this is not mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology. It's still a young field, which means in the first place, Sometimes we settle for the first solution, a good enough solution. And in the second place, many of my colleagues and me too at times have tried to build or construct efficient, very efficient, theoretically efficient algorithms, complicated algorithms, sacrificing simplicity. Now in both cases, maybe the solutions are not best possible. The design space for algorithms is very rich and it only gets richer as we uh, get faster and faster computers and more and more computers. So my goal in what I try to concentrate on when doing research is simplicity. Try to figure out what the simplest possible but efficient methods are to solve basic problems. Now, uh, Paul Erdos, who was a famous mathematician, had many interesting things to say. But among other ideas, he had this concept of proofs from the book, which means the book. Uh, not possible to improve it. Yes, so that's something to aspire to, design algorithms, theorems, proofs that are best possible. So in the case of algorithms, you want algorithms that are as simple as possible, with provable resource bounds for important input classes, and efficient in practice, efficient in practice. If it's not simple, it's not efficient in practice, nobody is going to use it. Einstein, I don't know if he actually said this, but this is attributed to him. Famous people get many sayings attributed to them, not all of them. But anyway, this is a wonderful idea. Make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. All right, on that note, let's get started here. We all know what sorting is. We're given a collection of n items, numbers, any items selected from a totally ordered set. We want to arrange them in increasing order. We're doing that using binary comparisons. Two elements with one figure. Is that a yes, no answer? There are n factorial possible permutations of the item. So we need at least log base two of n factorial comparisons if the answer. This is about n logging. It's a lower bound. Any comparison based algorithm for sorting takes n logging. And we know several algorithms. They accomplish this goal, uh, merge sort, for example, and heap sort in the worst case, quick sort on average. This is uh, first or second year computer science. But now let's take this question one step further. Sorting using partial information. What if somebody gives us the outcomes of certain comparisons in advance so we get a head start. What can we say in this case? Can we use partial information efficiently to complete the sorting process? So let's model a problem. A 
as a graph lab. I got started in graph algorithms with senior graph algorithms, data structures. Actually, VJ asked me to talk about linear time uh, graph algorithms, and that's going to come into play here in just a short second. Um, okay, so we've got a collection of existing comparisons. Let's treat the items as vertices, and we'll treat the comparison outcomes as directed edges from the smaller item to the larger. So we got one vertex per item, one arch for each comparison. If we have an outcome V is less than W, we put an arc in from V to W. It gives us a directed graph. And here's an example. So our items are A, B, C, and so on. We know that B is less than D, for example. We know A is less than D, for example, and so on. We're trying to totally order the set by doing additional comparisons. This graph has to be acyclic. Because if there were a cycle, that would be a contradiction. Uh, it's a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Now we're presented with an arbitrary set of comparison outcomes. We see here that there's an arc from A to H. That comparison is already, the outcome there is already implied by the A to D arc and the D to H arc. We know that A is less than D and D is less than H, and that implies A is less than H. That's a redundant arc. Um, the graph may or may not have redundant arcs in it. it it's arbitrary, we don't know. Uh, but we cannot assume that the graph is transitively reduced, that is, it does not have redundant arcs, nor that it's transitively closed, that is, it has all possible arcs. For example, we can conclude from this picture that H is less than, I'm sorry, H is greater than J because I is greater than J and H is greater than I, but mm -hmm. that arc is not in there. And if we need to test on this graph, uh, it's not constant time. We have to look at long paths to get somewhere. So we don't want to spend the time to find all the transitive arcs or remove all the redundant arcs because that's going to take more than n log n time, which is all we have to spend even if we don't have any information. All right, so here's a possible order. A first. B second, J third, and so on. Now, this problem has been studied quite a bit, actually. Mike Fredman, who was a contemporary of mine, both at Caltech, we were both undergraduates at Caltech and <clears throat> PhD students in the computer science department at Stanford in the early days. He got his PhD in two years flat, very impressive. Spent most of his career at Rutgers. Uh, in any case, in 1976, he wrote a beautiful paper looking at a very general sorting problem, even more general than sorting with partial information as I described it. So the problem he considered was the following. We're given an arbitrary subset of S, a possible total orders, a set of inputs. We don't know. We, we know the, the subset, but we don't know which one is the correct total order. We want to determine correct sorted order by doing binary comparisons with the others. So in our problem, the possible total orders or the topological orders, find this term in the, of, of the graph. Um, but there are other examples where the subset S is determined by some other kind of structure. So Fredman proved, this is a mathematical result more than an algorithmic result, that you can always achieve the lower bound, essentially. Uh, the information theory bound here says that if we're gonna, if we're going from this large subset S down to a single answer, every yes, no question only split the set into two pieces. If you take the larger piece, you can only reduce the size by half. So you have to use log of the size of S 
comparisons to get the answer. And you can achieve that to within an additive term that's linear in the number of layers. So the law, I guess, is required. Um, Redmond showed that for his more general problem, the, the N is also required. So this is a tight bound Boolean constant factor, but it's not algorithmically efficient. What he said was the algorithm in theorem 3.1, the proof that you can do this, requires considerable enumerative information about set F quartz construction. Translated into English, that means at least exponential time to figure out what comparisons to do to learn this algorithm. So the question is, is there a, uh, an efficient strategy, not only that reduces the number of comparisons, but one could actually run this. Well, that's a more general problem. Um, but he also looked at the particular problem I want to consider here, the sorting with pre-existing comparisons. Uh, both he in 1976 and actually Kislitsyn, who was Soviet, I believe, uh, 1978, conjectured that for the DAG sorting problem, there's always a comparison. So the lower bound says that the, the, the best you can do is sort of a 50-50 split. But as long as you could find some comparison that splits things into two roughly equal size pieces, one thinks one thinks three quarters, one quarter. Doesn't matter. As long as you can throw away constant fraction, you can always take log of the number of original possibilities and get down to the final answer. Log of that many comparisons. Uh, okay, so they conjecture that there's always a comparison that will split the candidate set at least two thirds, one third. Might be better, might be good. If there were such a comparison, then you could just repeat that and you would get a good sequence of comparison. Uh, you can't do better than one third, two third. As I said, any positive constant will give you a, a small comparison to sorting out. So Kahn, and this is Jeff Kahn and Mike Sachs, 1984, proved this conjecture for three elevenths, eight elevenths. But again, this was not a exponential of polynomial time construction. Uh, they proved that there is a comparison that works. So there is a way to do sorting of pre existing comparisons in the information theoretic bound on number of comparisons, but no efficient. Finding a good comparison takes super polynomial time. All right. Um, Khan and Kim, 1992, this is the same Khan. Uh, they found a polynomial time algorithm for this problem using the ellipsoid method. So we don't need to know what the ellipsoid method is, but it solves linear programs in polynomial time. And it's a Big hammer, big hammer. But in any case, this solves the problem, at least in terms of getting both an algorithm that minimizes to within the constant factor the number of comparisons and runs in polynomial time. But we can sort in n log n time, so it's not so good. So uh, there's a paper by Cardinal and several other people from 2013. So now we're starting to get out of the ancient history here. Um, they gave several polynomial time algorithms, um, none of which use the ellipsoid method. So they're simpler, but not yet. Simple. Is that the one person method? Uh, there's no map. I mean, I don't think there's matching in here, actually. I'd have to go back and look at the paper and it's matching. It was a 2.5. Yep, you might think it's matching, but I think it comes from something else. Um, so this, they, they gave an algorithm which runs in the right number of comparisons, but again, this is way beyond just sorting the numbers in the board. 
pre existing. So that was the state of the art uh, until this year. So the goal here is a simple algorithm. It runs in, well, what can we hope for? We can hope for, we're going to look at the comparison. So n is the number of items, m is the number of pre existing comparisons. And we look at the input data. And we're going to have to do order of log t comparisons. And so we have to spend that much time. And that's the goal. Do best possible. And the answer is we can do this using remarkably simple ideas, at least the algorithms. So how are we going to sort it that? Well, let's look at a more basic problem. So now back to previous year. We want to find a any topological order of the first z of the tag. So did I skip a slide somewhere? The definition of a topological order is an order of the vertices such that every arc goes from a small vertex to a large one. So the set of topological orders, these are the possible permutations that could answer our sorting task. Um, finding a topological order, again, this is a standard algorithmic question in undergraduate algorithms and data structures, uh, sometimes called PERT analysis, or it's related to PERT analysis. This is project evaluation and review technique. This is the U.S. Navy's term for this idea. U.S. Air Force call, uh, called it PEP. This goes back to the 1940s. The name PERT and the abbreviation has somehow stuck with us. But so, how do we find the topological order of a DAG? Uh, going back to the late 1950s, early 1960s, there were several uninteresting approaches to this problem, but uh, this is a different con. This is ACON in 1964, published a short paper in Communications of ACM with one of the now classic algorithms for this problem. Find a source, find a vertex with no entering arcs. You can number that one or order it first. Remove it, find another source. Remove it, find another source, remove it, keep going. Either we exhaust all the vertices in the day or else we reach a situation where there is no source, that is all the vertices have at least one incoming arc. In that situation, there is a cycle because if we start at any vertex and back up and the graph is finite, we're gonna come back and form a cycle. So this algorithm will either uh, order the vertices in an order consistent with the, the arcs or it will find a cycle. Uh, now we need a way to implement this. So we got to keep track of the set of sources. Con, there are some nice ideas in this paper. Back in those days, people were just starting to explore risk processing. And I don't know if this is the first example, but in Con's paper, he uses an adjacency list representation for his graph. So essentially for each vertex, he's keeping track of the set of output. We pre-process the graph, compute for each vertex, it's in degree, the number of incoming arcs. Vertices of in degree zero are the sources. Every time we delete a vertex, we look at the outgoing arcs, update the in degrees, and maybe we get more candidates for sources. Now, Khan, in order to find the next source, he didn't have a data structure to keep track of the sources. He scanned through the entire vertex list every time to find a new source. So this algorithm runs in uh, n squared time, I guess. Knuth gave the definitive algorithm in volume one, this The Art of Computer Programming in 1969. Uh, he took Khan's algorithm and added a Q to keep track of the set of sources. 
and we've got a linear time equalizer. Furthermore, uh, Kahn and Schwarzfeider in 1973 published a paper with the same algorithm. Basically, they observed that you can get all possible topological orders by repeatedly deleting the sources in all possible ways. So they gave a backtracking algorithm to enumerate all the topological orders. So we're sticking here instead of a Q. Well, if we're doing backtracking, we can store this as a Q and use some kind of uh, backtracking strategy to get out all the possibilities. Now we're looking for a particular order, a one that's consistent with the unknown total order of the vertices. Here's an example graph again. The initial sources are A, B, and J. They have n degrees zero, so we could pick any one of them. If we pick A, for example, or from A to B goes away. So D starts out with n degree two, it goes down to one, it's not yet a source, and H goes down to two, not yet one. If we then delete D, then D becomes a source, and E becomes a source, and J has been a source from the beginning. So here's one possible topological. Now there's an obvious extension to the bank sorting problem. I'll call it topological heap sort. Instead of using a Q as in Camus' original algorithms, we just store the set of vertices, the sources, sorry, the set of sources, the candidates to be the next vertex in a heap. Priority Q. So that's the algorithm. Initialized by computing an n degree of every vertex, inserting those of n degree zero in the heap, repeatedly delete the minimum source from the heap. So every you compare vertices, we're assuming their identities are, we can compare them directly. Uh, so we delete the minimum source, we add it to the sorted list, we delete it, makes exiting arcs from the graph. Add any new sources to the heap. With a standard heap implementation, again from freshman or sophomore level computer science, uh, every deletion, every delete min operation takes logarithmic time. So the total time is going to be linear in the number of arcs and pre existing comparisons plus n log n. The number of comparisons is and log in. So at least we're matching the standard sorting bound here. Um, but we got a simple algorithm. Maybe it looks like this is the end of the story, but this log in bound for heat deletion, minimum deletion, this is a worst case bound. Yes. So it may be that our heap doesn't have, it doesn't have everything in it. It's only got the possible sources as the candidates now. And somehow that set is related to the number of possible total orders. And if we can take advantage of that somehow, maybe we can improve this. So we want to consider the possibility that our heap is adaptable. Wait, so is it wrong? Oh, yeah. It, uh, it behaves in a way that depends upon the way it is used. So how do we define adaptivity or self-adjustment? This is a, this turns out to be a key idea, one key idea of getting this all to work. So I'm gonna define a non-worst case bound heaps and then the question is is there an implementation that gives us this bound and then what good it is so let me define the bound first of all uh, we consider an arbitrary sequence of insertions into the minimum deletions from a heap so any item goes into the heap end of the heap gets this is time being useful sits in the heap for a while and then goes away I'll show a picture of this later on. 
so uh, we look at those items that were inserted in the heap after this one. This is X, it's inserted, it goes away, sitting in there for a while. Some other elements come in, maybe they go out. At any given time while X is in the heap, we look at its working set, which is the set of those elements, including itself, that were inserted at or after it was inserted. So this set can, it starts out at one because the stuff that was inserted earlier doesn't count. That's the important one. The, it's only the later one. So the working set starts out at size one. It could grow and shrink over time. And there's some value in the text explaining the leader. The maximum size of the working set, this is the value. The working set size of W of X is the maximum size of its working set while it's in the heap. And we'll say a heap has the working set bound. If the time to insert an item is constant, and the time to delete an item, and it's the minimum, is order of log of the working set size rather than log. Esoteric, but what it is. So, first question Are there any heap implementations that have the working set bound? And if so, are they good for anything? The answer to both questions is yes, or I would not be presenting. <laughs> so, John, here's where John comes into picture. Uh, in, he was a student of Mike Fredman's at Rutgers. Done a lot of work on data structures. Um, so in 2000, he defined this property, the working set bound heaps, <clears throat> and proved that a self adjusting kind of heap called the pairing heap has this bound. The bounds are amortized, which means that if we add up the total time for all the operations, the total time is within the sum of the bound times for all those operations, provided that the heap ends empty, which is what happens in our case because uh, we're trying to sort them. Uh, the, the idea, you got this idea from splay trees, which are a form of self-adjusting binary search trees, where there is a related, there's something called the working set bound, which is defined in a similar way, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, it turns out, not only do pairing heaps have the working set bound, I'll tell you what pairing heaps are in a moment, but it's not too hard to get this bound in various ways. You can use splay trees as heaps and get this bound again if the heap ends up being empty or there's a land up there. Uh, El Masri in 2006 designed a heap with an even stronger property. So we've got the working set bound here really knowing growing and shrinking over time. We just look at the size of the working set when the element is actually deleted and use that to get the bound. So that might be smaller. It might get real big in the middle and get smaller at the end. Um, his data structure is a little bit complicated, but there's a reasonably straightforward way to get this bound using something called a finger search tree. Uh, and, all of this stuff was without an application, I think. So maybe people didn't pay too much attention to it. Uh, work. So strong working set bound, this turns out to be more than we need. The working set bound thing can be enough for us, which means we can use this simple data structure pairing heap again. This was invented by Mike Fredman again several others of us. Um, so we need to talk a little bit about heaps. What do we want to do? Our situation is very simple. We're only doing insertions and deletions. So we need to be able to create an empty heap, insert items into it, and delete the minimum. So we'll represent our heap by a rooted tree, which has heap order, which means that they have a parent-child relationship. The node in the parent is smaller than the node in the child. So all the children are smaller. So the root is the minimum, the minimum. 
if I have two of these trees, maybe I should illustrate here first. Here's a heap ordered tree. I've got numbers stored in here. Five is the minimum. Five is bigger than all of its children. Seven is bigger than its children. There's no specific order among the children. All the ordering is top to bottom. And importantly, this tree is not binary. The number of children of a node can grow essentially arbitrarily. We can put two of these trees together by comparing their roots, making the bigger root the child of the small. So that linking operation, that's our basic operation. We do everything in terms of linking and removing. And the number of children of a node is not bounded by a constant. It depends on the sequence of operations. So here's a heap ordered tree. We need a way to represent this in the computer. We cannot represent a node with an arbitrary number of children directly. So we use the, first of all, here's a link. We have a tree with root 10 and another tree with root eight. We compare the eight and the 10. The eight wins, the 10 becomes a child of the eight. We're maintaining the nodes, the children in order by link time, um, earliest to latest. So the first child is the most recent. But again, here's our heap order tree. There's an implicit order here. Seven was linked to five, most recently three, since 16 before that, 27 before that. Again, we needed the right computer representation. Use what is called the binary tree representation, or we need a tree to define the infinite. Uh, we use two pointers per node, one to the first child of a node, and then to its next sibling. So the lists of children are formed singly linked lists, and we just have our formula, the first node in the list from the end. So the red pointers here are the original in the tree, but we represent this by two pointers per node. And now everything is simple. We can do a link in constant time by changing two pointers. If, if we had the eight here and it loses the five, we change the first pointer point from five to eight, and eight now needs to point to seven as its next sequence. So how do we do the heap op operations? To make a heap, we return an empty tree. Do an insertion, we create a new one node tree and link it with the existing tree. We just count the tree if the existing tree is empty. The important operation is to delete min, we delete the root. And now we've got a list of its children. Each one of those is a full fledged rooted tree, heap ordered tree. We have to link those together. And the question is, how do we do that? The time for a delete min is proportional to the number of children, constant time per child. So we need, we need a strategy for linking in delete means that keeps the number of children small. Now one can do this by storing uh, a proxy for size information and, and only linking trees that are roughly the same size. This idea led to another data structure called Fibonacci heaps. But here we're gonna do things very simply. Uh, after we delete the minimum, after we delete the root, we're gonna do two passes through the list of roots to link them all together. The first pass is a pairing pass. We just run through the list of roots. We take the first two link, they take the next two link, the next two link, link, link. link. We get to the end, we got half as many roots now. Now we start at the back end, we take the last node, link it to the next one coming back toward the front, link that result to the next one all the way back. So there's a left to right pairing pass and right to left assembly pass, like so. So I haven't drawn the subtrees here, but we can imagine that each of these nodes has a subtree attached to it. It's only the roots that are involved in this operation. So we delete five, which is the minimum. And now we get subtrees rooted at seven, 24, and so on. 
a pairing pass is going to win seven and 24 with seven winning. Anyone at 18 and 18 winning, 16 and 27, 28 and 10. So after the pairing pass, we get something like this. Now we start with the 10, which is the last one here. We had an even number of roots. If we had an odd number of roots, there would be one left over when we start the drive. So now we run in the other order. We link the 10 and the 16, the 10 wins, 10 and the 18 and the 10 wins again, and the 10 and the seven, and the seven wins, and the final outcome is this tree. So that's the entire description of pairing pass. As you can see, they're quite simple and they're very efficient. In practice, and one can prove that um, uh, they have constant amortized time for insertion in the log and uh, amortized time for the lead min. But as I said, John managed to prove that these this simple data structure has this rhythm set. Uh, so our algorithm now is let's run this topological heap sort and use a pairing heap. And the claim is that the running time is what we wanted, m plus n plus log of the number of possible topological orders. The number of comparisons is not quite what we wanted. If we go linear, we end overhead on comparisons here. And I'll come back to this. So I have neglected to tell you the analysis of pairing heaps, which is one technical part. And um, as an example of a very simple data structure with a not so simple analysis, both the data structure and actually the behavior of this topological heap sort algorithm, even though the algorithms are simple, the analysis is the interesting part. And I don't want to have your eyes glaze over. I'll refer you to the paper, which is going to be on archive as soon as we cross the T's and dot the I's. Uh, so, but let me say something about how we can possibly prove something like this. We need to connect the time of the lead min operations to the number of possible topological orders. So we're going to generate a lower bound on the log number of total orders. It depends on the behavior of the algorithms. And then relate this bound, the working set bound to the heap operations. Um, I should say, by the way, here's an example. I don't want to say that. But here's an example that illustrates why you need something more than a standard heap. So here's an example. It's a very simple example. We've got a long path. We've got some large, but relatively small number of single vertices. So all the comparisons that we're given begin to form this total order on path. Um, if we run this algorithm with a standard heap, what's going to happen? We put all these vertices plus this one, five in this case, into the heap. And then we start deleting a minimum and possibly adding new sources. So let's suppose we're in a situation where the these are all small and these are all large. So we start deleting these vertices and the heap always stays at size five. So every the K is the number of singleton vertices here. We're gonna have to do roughly N until the heap starts shrinking, which happens very late in the process. We're gonna have to do at least log k work per the lead min because that's the size of our heap. So we're going to spend n log k time and n log k comparisons. On the other hand, for the working set heap, this example turns out to behave better because the, the heap starts out with the singleton nodes plus the first node on the, on the path here. Um, and <clears throat> Whatever the first node deleted, these are all the, the, the working set nodes for that set. But notice that 
And you will notice that I add here, every time I delete a node from this path, the next node on the path goes into the heap. But the working set, the, the first, uh, the working set of this node, which goes in after all the others, uh, its working set only has size one because all of the other ones were in, no, uh, stuck in first. So this node, this node, this node, this node, they're only in one at a time. When the next one goes in, the previous one went out. So their working sets are all size one. So this bound tells us that we only need n plus k log k comparisons, which could be much smaller than n log k. So this is an example to show that this is not completely true of what is going on. So uh, let me just introduce some of these concepts that we need in order to get this analysis to work. So we consider a run of the algorithm and we'll look at the time that each vertex is in the heap. So it's anywhere from some interval starting from T of V, which is vertex of V. T of V was the insertion time, T prime would be the deletion time. So we got these intervals of time. We can now define a graph, which is an interval graph. It's got these intervals and two intervals are adjacent if they overlap. The intervals correspond to the two vertices. Now, interval graphs are very special. But what we're gonna do then is partition, you're interested in sets of items that are in the heap at the same time, which correspond to splices through these intervals. We're going to partition the, the vertices based upon peaks of intervals, basically sets that are simultaneously in the heap at the same time. And we do this in a greedy way, perhaps better to show a picture here. So here's uh, a run or part of a run of the algorithm on this graph. So A goes in, J goes in, B goes in. These are the original sources. And one of them goes out, maybe it's A. Then B goes out. When A and B both go out, we put E in the heap because it's a new source. And we also put D in the heap. And then we take J out, put I in because I becomes a source when J goes out. So these are the intervals. So A goes in at whatever time this is. Time is going down in the page. A goes in at this time and it goes out at this time. J goes in at this time and out at this time. So, so uh, the interval graph is a set of intervals of the corresponding vertices, and two of them are adjacent in this <coughs> auxiliary graph if their time intervals overlap. So in this case, I colored these based upon the partition, right? The red, the maximum overlap here is the set of red intervals down at the bottom. When I take this set out, this set of three blue intervals up here, this is the next biggest. And then this one comes out at the end. And this wasn't the full run because I couldn't get it colored. But now you can relate the number of intervals in these sets for the working set bound in such a way as to prove that this was a, <coughs> our enclosure. Uh, and there are some interesting technical details here, which I don't have time to get into, but that's, that's kind of the idea. So, we order the cliques in increasing order by time, basically. Cliques partition the vertices of the original bag all the arcs go from one clique to the, the next one, which means that all these cliques, all these vertices within the same clique at the same time. We don't know anything about their sorted order to begin with, which means that we can count the topological orders, we can estimate the topological orders because we can take any order of the vertices in a clique independent of any other clique. So we get a lower bound on the number of total orders, which is the product of the factorials of the sizes of the cliques. 
And then if we take logarithms, we get that the log of the number of total orders is at least this kind of sum, the sum over this cliques in this partition of the number of vertices in the clique times the log of the number of vertices in the clique and there's a subtractive division. And then we relate this bound, the working set bound, because these clique sizes turn out to be the working set bound sizes for the corresponding items. And um, the technical part here is the fact that when we remove cliques, we're decreasing working set sizes and we have to account for that. Probably enough. But we get a there's a factor of two that comes out of the technical part, but we're ignoring the constant factors. They're small, but there are two places where we don't get exactly one times log t comparisons. There's a factor of two here, and there's also some constant factor in the uh, pairing heap analysis, which is also small, but it's greater than one. Now, one more point here, which is that there was a plus n in our comparison. This only is relevant if the original comparisons give us so much information that the number of total orders is very small. This only happens if there is a long path in the stag. There's a path that goes through like nine tenths of the vertices or 99 one hundredths or whatever constant factor. We can add an extra piece to the algorithm to get rid of the comparisons because these comparisons, the little n comparisons, because if we have a long path, that's a total order. We don't need any comparisons to verify. So the extra step is we'll do a, uh, find the topological order, any topological order takes no comparisons. Compute longest paths, which we can do by scanning through the topological order. Uh, find a globally longest path and essentially remove that to a from the uh, topological heap sort algorithm on what is left. And then as those vertices get generated in order, we insert them into the long path using a combination of exponential and binary search to make long story short, that gets rid of this additive n in the uh, end path. So we end up with linear plus log t running line for this algorithm. The number of comparisons is O of log t, which is both of which are best possible representatives. Now this actually, this whole idea actually came from slightly earlier work. Um, turns out Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm looks very similar. These ideas were originally applied to show that Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm has a kind of adaptive optimality in the sense that if you give me a directed graph, and you don't tell me a starting point source, I want to compute distances to all the vertices in sorted order to <coughs> tell me the arc weights. I run Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm with one of these adaptive heaps with a pairing heap. I get an optimal algorithm for that particular graph subject to not knowing what the arc weights are. <laughs> so slightly different problem, but the two are very closely related and the same techniques give us similar results for both problems. Again, there's uh, the basic algorithm, Dijkstra's algorithm, there's an additive linear term in the number of comparisons and you need a similar extra step to get rid of the additive term. It's a different extra step, but it's kind of the same technique. So in conclusion, we're not done yet. There are simple, basic problems that have simple solutions that people have not discovered. And I am still enjoying doing this. And we thank you all. <laughs>
Don't be shy. Questions on any subject. <laughs> any uh, anything in algorithms from your homework, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you. We're very clear about those. As Bob said, you know, these are the last two years of the course in North Korea. Forty, I guess, at least. Or so, thank you. Oh, 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 sorry, one question. Sorry. Can you make a few examples of the hardness of some application? Uh, so, we know the partial order of the elements. We want to remove, we want to reveal the whole. In what application I, is I, I thought? That's a very good question. I don't have an answer for that one, but I have an answer for a related question, which is suppose you only want to find the first K elements and you have some partial order information. I've seen references to this actually in machine learning literature where people are trying to rank order things, find the top K recommendations to report and you have some partial information Maybe you want to ask people for something very expensive. So actually, for the, the for the top K problem, we think this algorithm is going to solve that problem. Yeah, too many. Yeah, that's a lot more comparisons. But we're still looking. 